Thank you very much. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to be here today to uh, tell you about our work, experimental work, on ultra-strong light matter coupling in high Q terahertz cavities. So uh, uh, we're doing spectroscopy of condensed matter systems in the terahertz range, um, or mi uh, in terms of photon energies, milliev, uh, wavelengths, in terms of wavelengths, hundreds of microns, uh, and in terms of wave number 33. Um, so uh, in, this range is very, very rich in, in solid state physics. There are lots of elementary and collective excitations, phonons, plasmons, magnons, cyclotron resonance, superconducting gap excitations. So the idea is to strongly couple with these excitations in a cavity. So we have constructed a high Q a terahertz cavity. Um, so our, our typical line width, the photonic uh, the decay rate is 2.5, uh, a few gigahertz, whereas the center frequency of, of, of the cavity is, is a few terahertz. So the, the order of magnitude of the Q factor of, of, of our cavities is about 1,000, corresponding to a, a photon lifetime of about 70 picoseconds and a finesse of 100. This is all happening in, in, the, in the terahertz frequency range. So let me first tell you about our uh, cavity design. So uh, what, what we use is plates of silicon, intrinsic high resistivity, uh, non-doped silicon, which, which, whose absorption coefficient is very, very small in the terahertz range. But it has a large index. So uh, the so basically, so our cavity is a DBR cavity. And so we, we, we have alternating layers of silicon vacuum, silicon vacuum. So high index material silicon, whose index is 3.42, and the, the vacuum is 1. So, we, we, so there's a huge contrast, contrast between the two materials. So uh, just by having two layers, uh, uh, you can easily calculate the reflectivity to be 97%. If you have three layers, the reflectivity is already 99.7%. So most of the work uh, uh, we have done so far has been done with two or three layers of, of silicon. And what's great about this design is this is, this is an ideal um, laboratory, terahertz cavity laboratory for condensed matter systems. So, uh, we, so here in, inside, we, we can place any any material. This is a very good platform for studying ultra uh, uh, ultra strong light matter coupling in condensed matter systems. We can we can we can measure bulk bulk samples or also film samples on a ter terahertz transparent substrate. So the main topic uh, of this talk is ultra strong light matter coupling. So we we study polaritons. Uh, as in the first two talks in this session. And the, um, so basically we, we have omega zero, which is the, the photonic mode frequency in the cavity. And then uh, by some means, we, we tune the matter frequency. Okay? Often in this case, uh, in our case, magnetic field. Okay? So the matter frequency changes. And they meet here, and then they show anti-crossing behavior. And the coupling rate we, we denote by G, and the resonance frequency omega zero. So polaritons uh, appear in the strong coupling regime, where the light matter coupling rate G is larger than the line width, or gamma and kappa, matter decay rate and the cavity decay rate. So in the frequency domain, you can see Rabi splitting. But ordinarily, the, the, uh, the, the, the resonance frequency omega zero is much, much larger than G. Like orders of magnitude larger if you look at exciton polaritons, typically. Okay? But what we are talking about here is not just strong coupling regime, but ultra-strong coupling regime, where this condition is, uh, is not <coughs> satisfied, which means that the, the coupling rate or the Rabi frequency becomes a significant fraction of the transition frequency itself. Or sometimes it's even larger than the, the transition frequency. There's no clear, clear cut definition about the, the ultra strong coupling regime, but let's say 10%. Okay? 
Okay, so they, when G becomes larger than 10% of the, the uh, uh, transition frequency, we call it the ultra-strong coupling regime. So let me first uh, uh, tell you why we're working in the terahertz frequency range. So if we start with, with a simple two-level um, atom system in, in, in a cavity and resonating, uh, interacting with a single mode of, 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 of photons, at uh, two states zero and one with a, with a, a transition energy omega zero, the coupling G, so the, the Rabi frequency is, is the product of the dipole moment of, of the transition and the amplitude of the vacuum fluctuation field in, uh, in this cavity at this particular frequency. So if you, if you divide G by, by the photon frequency omega zero, you get this expression. So in order to make this large, G over omega zero large, you, you want to have a, a, large, a, a large dipole moment transition, which exists in, in the terahertz range. There, there are many <coughs> transitions in, in solid state materials, which has huge dipole moments. And you want to go to small frequencies. Instead of optical frequencies, you, you, you can go to far infrared terahertz frequencies. Okay, so that's why we are, uh, are doing this in the terahertz range. Once this is satisfied, what happens? So first of all, the rotating wave approximation breaks down, which leads to a finite frequency shift known as the block Seeger shift. Second, uh, the diamagnetic term or the A squared term in the Hamiltonian, which is usually negligible, becomes not only negligible, and also it plays a major role in, in determining some of the, uh, the physical uh, uh, processes uh, that I'm going to talk about today. And more interestingly, that the ground state properties are significantly modified through non-perturbative coupling with the vacuum electric field. Specifically, as shown by uh, Chuti and co-workers in 2005, uh, the nature of the ground state becomes non-classical. It's a two-mode squeezed vacuum state. And uh, uh, so the, the ground state acquires finite amplitude of both vacuum, vacuum field and the matter excitation. These are virtual fields, but if, if, um, if you can quickly change the condition, it's, it's predicted to be possible to release these virtual photons uh, as real photons. And most excitingly, it has a very, very uh, a heatedly debated possibility of uh, the Dickey superating phase transition uh, uh, occur. So, so I, I'll discuss all these uh, in, in this talk. So for the next 10, 15 minutes or so, I want to uh, introduce you to a specific system um, where we, we demonstrated ultra-strong coupling, um, showing the breakdown of the rotating wave approximation, uh, uh, showing uh, a, a clear uh, va uh, vacuum block Seagull shift. So here, so in, in the middle of this cavity, we inserted a two-dimensional electron gas. High mobility, uh, two-dimensional electron gas in gallium arsenide, uh, which is placed on top of a silicon substrate. And we did terahertz transmission experiments in the presence of a perpendicular magnetic field in the Faraday geometry. So the magnetic field is applied this way, and the, the, the terahertz beam propagated along the magnetic field direction. So the, the magnetic field quantizes the electronic structure uh, into lambda levels. So what we have is, is a, is a two-dimensional electron gas which is quantized due to the perpendicular magnetic field and to lambda levels, which is placed inside this high Q terahertz cavity. And so this two deck has a certain Fermi energy. So the, the coupling uh, we, we are looking at is, so the transition we are looking at is a transition from the highest occupied lambda level to the lowest unoccupied lambda level. Okay, so. So in, in the case of gallium arsenide, it has a very parabolic band with a constant effective mass. So uh, each, each lambda level increases in frequency linearly with increasing magnetic field. So when, the, when this transition cyclotron resonance frequency uh, increases with increasing magnetic field, when it meets uh, uh, the, 
the photon frequency we see at uh, Rabi splitting. Okay? So this particular topic was pioneered by Jerome Feist in, in, in the audience, and he's using metamaterial uh, cavities and on various semiconductor uh, uh, 2D structures, and uh, uh, reporting huge values of G over omega zero parameters. So our cavity design is, is, is different. Uh, so we are using uh, uh, the 1D photonic crystal cavity that I uh, mentioned at, at the beginning. So this shows you a little bit more, more details about our, our design. So we, we have silicon, silicon vacuum, silicon vacuum, silicon vacuum. Right? So, so, uh, so here uh, we, we have a central piece of silicon on which we have a two-dimensional electron gas, gallium arsenide attached. So as you can see, the, the field distribution is designed in such a way that the, the peak, the peak of the field coincides with the location of the two-dimensional electron gas. And this is one of the one of the multiple photonic modes in the cavity. So this is this mode is centered at 0.4 terahertz. This is the, the, the first mode. We have the second mode and third mode at different frequencies. And within the, the frequency bandwidth of a terahertz spectrometer, so the, the, these, these three modes fit, but uh, they exist. And each, each mode appears in the middle of, of a photonic um, stop band. Okay, so here, so there's no transmission here, and inside we have this mode. Okay, if you expand it, you see that the, the full width is very, very sharp. The full width at half maximum is 2.3 gigahertz. So we have we have a long time window to ensure that we have enough time res uh, spectral resolution to 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 see, to, uh, see this. Okay. So so here this is the first mode. This is the second mode. This is the third mode. Okay. So there are three three modes at, at different frequencies. And then we do um, magnetic field scans. The uh, the magnetic field, as the magnetic field changes, the cyclotron resonance frequency increases linearly. And when it hits the first mode, first photonic mode, we see this anti-resonance, anti-crossing. Uh, and this is the second photonic mode. This is the third photonic mode. What you see here that at mu, the index nu, is the lambda level filling factor uh, defined by, by this. So this tells you. At, at, at a given magnetic field, how many lambda levels are occupied? Right? So as, as we increase the magnetic field, the degeneracy of each lambda level increases. So the filling factor becomes smaller and smaller. So and eventually, we can go to the fractional quantum hole regime, but we haven't, we haven't been there. So all, all, the, all our measurements have been done in the integer quantum hole uh, regime. So f the first thing we wanted to know was whether there's any systematic dependence on the filling factor. Whether the, the G, the Rubby, Rubby splitting depends on the on the filling factor, so we, we found a very small small dependence. Okay, so the, the 2G is 72 gigahertz at nu equals 12, 66 gigahertz and 60 gigahertz. So the as we decrease the magnet, decrease the filling factor, the the, the Rubby splitting increases. No, I'm sorry, de decreases slightly. It turns out that there's a lot of cancellation happening. So the, uh, we, we, we can easily estimate the, the, the vacuum Rabi splitting in, in this case. This is the dipole moment times the vacuum fluctuation electric field uh, strength and the, the square root of, of n behavior. But d depends on the magnetic length and the filling factor. And the magnetic length depends on the cyclotron frequency. And the vacuum fluctuation field at this cyclotron frequency, depend, obviously, depends on the magnetic field. So there's a lot of cancellation. Eventually, 2G is independent of the magnetic field. There's no explicit magnetic field dependent, except this LZ. The, the, the cavity, cavity the mode length, or mode, mode volume, changes between this and this, this. That's why, that's, that's why the, the 2G body is changing. But there's no explicit magnetic field dependence. Let me show you uh, more, more details about uh, the experimental spectra. So here I'm showing you transmission experimental ex uh, transmission spectra taken at different magnetic fields from minus 3 tesla to plus 3 tesla. 
as you can see, you, uh, we have a very narrow transition which is moving rapidly with the uh, magnetic field. So the first thing I want to point out is this. So this, the sign, the sign of the magnetic field is important because we are using circularly polarized terahertz radiation. So um, because the electrons are charged, so when you apply a magnetic field, the electrons are moving in, in, in one direction. So when you have two circular polarizations, only one of them uh, uh, is, is supposed to couple uh, with, with, the, with the cyclotron motion. So, so that's what I mean by cyclotron resonance active. So active means that the, so the, 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 the direction of the circular polarization matches the, the, the motion, direction of the cyclotron motion of the electron. Okay? So uh, th therefore, this zero determining point. So this is the cyclotron frequency. This is the photonic mode. This crossing occurs on the positive magnetic field side. And the yeah, so this is the this is omega c electron cyclotron resonance frequency. This is the the photonic mode, which is independent of the magnetic field. And the difference between the two is the detuning in this case. And the, the Rabi splitting depends on the detuning. And the detuning or the the, the, the ohm resonance Rabi frequency is two g. So that so this is what, what we get around one tesla positive one tesla. We get this a uh, 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 zero detuning. And first of all, I want to point out that the, this Rabi splitting is much, much larger than, than the line width. Right? So the frequency from here to here is 2G. And the width, which is given by some sort of average between the, the matter decay rate and photon decay rate, is given by the line width. And in fact, the, the so-called cooperativity of 4G squared over gamma kappa is 3,513, which is extremely large. So we're definitely in the in the strong coupling regime in, in, in the usual sense. And in addition, 2G over omega 0, this is the, the, the Rabi frequency divided by the, 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 the center frequency. This is the so-called normalized Rabi frequency is 72%. So that we are in, in the ultra strong coupling regime. And I want to direct your attention to, to this behavior. So this is the most important um, uh, feature of, 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 this, of, of this plot. Basically, what's happening here? Right? So here, as I, as I already mentioned, the magnetic field is, is applied in the opposite direction. Right? So, the, so the, the, the electrons are moving this way, but the, the circular polarization light is moving in the other direction. Right? So, the, so in, in, in a classical sense, they shouldn't interact. Right? And this, this happens because we are in the ultra strong coupling regime. So, in fact, if, 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 we, if we continuously tune this parameter, increase this parameter, g over omega 0, in the weak coupling regime, everything should be happening on the positive side. Right? Like, so this is the upper polariton, lower polariton, everything should be happening in the vicinity of this zero, uh, of this, uh, zero detuning point. Nothing should be happening on the negative magnetic field side. But as we increase this parameter, this this anti-crossing behavior becomes larger and larger and larger, and eventually it, it spreads over into the negative magnetic field region. So this is what's happening. So qualitatively speaking, that, that's what's, what's happening. But a little more quantitatively, let, let me explain to you how we can model this, starting from the, the most basic uh, JC Hamiltonian, uh, the matter term and the, uh, the light term, and the interaction. This is within the rotating wave approximation. But uh, uh, already in 1940, uh, it was pointed out by Bloch and Seeger that the, when, when the intensity of light becomes large or coupling becomes large, sufficient large, the rotating wave approximation breaks down, which means that the counter-rotating terms need to be included. So within the same Hamiltonian, we have to add these counter-rotating terms. In addition, uh, we have to add these uh, so-called A squared terms. Okay, so, so all these are uh, photon, photon parameters, photon operators, but the coefficient eta <coughs> depends on, on the coupling constant. Right? So this is purely photonic, but, then the, 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 but it, this doesn't exist if the coupling becomes zero. So this, this is sort of the, the, the schematically, I'm showing you what, what, what's needed to be included in order to explain 
um, our data. But real theoretical calculations were done by Motoaki Bamba at Osaka University, and all the, all the details are, are, are provided in this recent archive paper. So, uh, so this is specifically for, for our, our system, two-dimensional electron gas in, in a perpendicular magnetic field in, in, in a cavity. And uh, so there, there are four terms, one, two, three, four. Uh, this is the matter Hamiltonian, uh, Landau quantized electrons. And the, the cavity, uh, the photonic modes, we, we, have, we have multiple photonic modes included. And we, so we explicitly include the, the circular polarization state, polarization. And then the interaction Hamiltonian, which contains both the, the co-rotating and counter-rotating uh, contributions, and the A squared term. So, so the great thing about this is we can, we can turn on and turn off different terms in the Hamiltonian, and then compare with the experiment to see what each term is doing to, to, uh, to, to the behaviors. So, so here on the left, I have ex experimental data. On, on the right, I have theoretical calculations. And the, the CRI mode is, is folded onto the positive magnetic field size so that we can see everything, upper polariton, CRI, and the, the lower polariton. So here, I'm showing you the theoretical results without counter-rotating terms, without A squared. So as, as you can see, the agreement is, is poor. But first, I want to introduce the A squared term to see what it does. Okay, so it, it, it's this with, this is with the about A squared term. This is without, with, without, with, without. So as you can see, what it does is basically the A squared term uh, it increases the, the, all, all the all the three modes. Right? So basically, some, some sort of zero point energy is, is increased by including this A squared term. And uh, next, I will introduce the counter rotating terms. So this is this is with without with without with without. Basically, what you see is that the counter rotating terms affect only the cyclotron resonance in active mode. That makes sense, right? Because physically, that's where the, the magnetic field is negative. So the electrons and photons are moving in the opposite way. That's where the, the, the counter rotating terms play the, the, the major role. So only when we include both the A squared term and the counter rotating terms, we, we get satisfactory agreement between the theory and experiment. So, uh, so I, I showed you this already, but basically the vacuum block C that shift appears only on the CRI side and only in the ultra strong coupling regime. So excuse me, can we yes. go back one slide? Yes. So just looking at it by eye, it appears that there's a moderate quantitative difference in the dispersion of the upper polariton mode, even after everything is included. Right? That the upper branch it, or is it that the magnetic field scales are different? In, in, is between upper yeah. polariton and lower polariton? No, I was just comparing theory and experiment. The, yeah, the, I'm the, sorry. The field so, scales are different. Oh, by, oh by I'm sorry. Of, it's, oh, the field scales are different by a factor oh, of yeah. two. I'm sorry. That's the reason. Excuse me. Okay. okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Right, okay. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so the. the yeah, okay. Because you would think that should agree essentially perfectly. Yeah. Okay. It does. I think okay. it does. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Any other question? <laughs> So, so let me quickly summarize what I have talked about so, so far. So uh, terahertz cavity uh, QED, so we have developed high Q terahertz cavities that are easy to fabricate and usable for studying a variety of materials at low temperatures and high magnetic fields. So this is, this is an, a, a very useful uh, environment for studying condensed matter physics in, in, uh, in, under, in the presence of strong light matter coupling. And specifically, we studied high mobility 2 DAG uh, in the integer quantum Hall regime, observing coherent light matter coupling, which produced Landau polaritons in the strong coupling regime. And the ultra strong coupling uh, uh, produced, and, and the combination of ultra strong coupling and high Q and ultra high mobility uh, produced a record high cooperativity, 3.0 times to 10 to the 2. And we observed a, a very clear uh, evidence uh, for, for the breakdown of, of the rotating wave approximation uh, through the vacuum block Seagull shift. So basically, the, this cavity terahertz, cavity terahertz cavity QED is, is really exciting because 
It, it combines the three things, terahertz strong field physics, terahertz quantum optics, and terahertz condensed matter physics. Yes? So in this experiment with this integer quantum polyphic, are there any uh, phenomena that rely on many-body physics? So do you need any many-body physics of electrons to understand your data? Or it's all so uh, so far, all, all, the, all the results uh, we have reported mm -hmm. can be understood within a single particle mm -hmm. picture. So the, the next step is to, to explore more about the, the many-body aspects. And uh, so th that's what I want to talk about but a little more. But, but the, um, yeah, so the, the great thing about condensed matter systems, compared to atomic systems, is we are dealing with a huge number of particles. Right? So we, we have this massive many-body enhancement. First of all, this is even without including Coulomb interaction. This is just just a sheer number of, of huge number of, of particles we're dealing with. So the, 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 the squeeze shows you that the, the vacuum Rabi splitting scales are, uh, uh, is proportional to the square root of the number of, of, of electrons. So here we, we change the, the, the electron density at different samples, and also in a single sample, we, we change the density. So we, we have this so-called uh, Dickey cooperativity. So uh, this was already mentioned, but so the Tavis Cummings or Dickey Hamiltonian within the rotating wave approximation. So uh, you know, instead of JC Hamiltonian, we have a collection of atoms, identical atoms. And by introducing this collective excitation of uh, bosonic operators, one, one can rewrite the interaction in, in this way. So this means that the, we, we can treat the system as a single single atom with a huge dipole moment, it, it, it is so that the collective system is is responding to light together co collectively. So this is called Dickey cooperativity. So again, so this can be enhanced by, by many orders of magnitude by by using condensed matter system. This is uh, um, uh, exciting because we can we can chase the possibility of, of, of this Dickey phase transition, which was predicted in 1973 by, by two uh, theory groups uh, independently, Hep and Lieb and, and Wong and, and Hoy. So the, the, this, this new phase can appear when the coupling constant G becomes even larger, even larger than the, 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 the uh, transition frequency. So basically, the, the, the Rabi frequency becomes larger and larger. So the lower polariton branch can become even lower in, in energy than the original ground state. And then a new ground state appears where the, the, the average number of photons becomes finite. So this axis is g over omega 0. So, th so this average number of photons in the this, this is not photons you're putting in. It, this is coming out in, in, in the vacuum in, in, in the cavity. And the, so the, this, this depends on both temperature and the temperature and the, the coupling constant. So this new phase is predicted to exist at low enough temperatures below Tc and high enough coupling constant. So uh, this, it's important to note that the, this transition occurs even at T equals 0. So this is, in, in more recent theoretical papers, this transition is discussed as a quantum phase transition, which occurs even at t equals 0. But this, this has been a very controversial issue among theorists. And uh, so the, there's a no-go theorem already published in 1975 okay, from, from a group in, in, in Poland. So their, their criticism was very, very clear. So they, in, in the original 1973 papers, they did not include a square term. And the, the, the point is, if you include a square term, the lower uh, the polariton branch will never cross the ground state. It, it, it asymptotically approaches zero. But th this, this question, whether it's possible to have this phase transition, um, has been discussed for many, many years. Uh, in 1978, 2004, uh, 2007 by Jonathan Keeling, 2014, 2014, and more recently 2018, 2019. So the, the theories are still discussing. So the, the, these papers discuss the, the if you are not careful, the, the gauge invariance is, is broken. There's some sort of uh, gauge ambiguities in the ultra strong coupling regime. And this, this, this paper appeared two, two months ago, 
right, by uh, Marco Polini and Alan McDonald, again, talking about a no-go no theorem. So the theories are still uh, debating. What I want to uh, 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 focus on is, is this, this paper, case of uh, Knight, Aronoff, and, and she in 1978. So all the other papers, they, they talk about electric dipole uh, interaction. But this, this paper mentioned that, they, that we cannot rule out phase transitions based on magnetic dipole interactions. That's why we, we were stimulated by this, and we, we started uh, looking at magnetic systems, where magnons are important. Okay. So the, the specific system we're working on is, is a, a rare earth orthoferrite, and specifically erbium ion oxide. And there are two subsystems. Ion subsystem, uh, which is antiferromagnetically at ordered at, at a very high temperature, and then at, at erbium, erbium uh, uh, subspin systems. And so, the, so there, are, there are two, two magnetic uh, subsystems in, inside, inside this. Okay. So the, uh, in the temperature range where we did measurements, uh, the ion, ion, ions are uh, antiferromagnetically ordered, but the, uh, the erbium <coughs> ions are independent. So uh, we can see terahertz magnon excitations, and uh, uh, even at room temperature, the very beautiful terahertz coherent excitations, ma magnons can appear. Erbium ions. Uh, on the other hand, are uh, uh, independent. They, they show uh, 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 they have four, four F electrons. And uh, in, uh, they have crystal field splittings and exchange splitting due to ion erbium uh, exchange interaction. And then when you apply an external magnetic field, Zeeman splitting appears. And since the crystal is, 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 is uh, anisotropic, so it depends on the, the cut, A cut, B cut, C cut, and for each cut, there, there are two polarizations. So we, we see all this complicated terahertz spectra. This is, like, we're basically doing atomic spectroscopy in, in a solid in the terahertz range. But the most important transition is this one. So this, this A transition, which is essentially the, uh, the EPR, electron paramagnetic resonance. So we, we're just fl flipping the spin. So, so these, spins are, these spins are independent, not, not ordered yet. Okay. Yes, please. Sorry, the oscillations that you showed before yes. are uh, taken with uh, terahertz transmission spectroscopy or yes. with pump probe fire day rotation? So this is simply terahertz transmission, transmission. spectroscopy. Okay. So the, this, this antiferromagnet has a small uh, uh, tilt, uh, what do you call, uh, canting, canting angle due to the jaloshinsky moria interaction. So there's a, a macroscopic magnetization. So we, we, we can couple with the magnetization directly. So do you generate the terahertz with optical rectification or yes. something else? Right. Okay. Yeah, the optical rectification outside, not, not outside, the yeah, free space. Yeah. Right, yeah. OK, thank you. Yes, so basically, yeah. so, so this spin up, spin down transition, so they, they, they coincide, right? So, so as, as we change the magnetic field, the EPR frequency, again, changes linearly. Okay? And then the, the magnum frequency, yes. And the, when they meet, they, they show anti anti yeah anti uh, uh, crossing uh, behavior so uh, uh, again motoaki bamba, uh, bamba developed uh, this theory the hamiltonian the original hamiltonian looks like this okay so the, it's the, 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 it's very different from light matter interaction hamiltonians but after some transformations and approximations this can be rewritten as as this way so the the, the important point is that there there's no a square term Okay, so uh, just the the, uh, the co-rotating, counter-rotating interactions exist, and we, we found that they. So in this paper, we, we described that there is Dicky cooperativity. So this this is promising. So we 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 systematically change the number of spins, and then this this uh, the vacuum Rabi splitting. This 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 is the coupling between the EPR and magnons. The, this, this coupling increased, and. Uh, uh, as a function of square root, so linearly increase square root of the effective number of spins. Okay, so this is a rather unusual situation that Dicky cooperativity is happening in a very magnetic context with, with no light involved. Let me quickly uh, 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 finish this talk by talking about the, the third uh, subject. This this is not terahertz. Okay, so this is but I, I wanted to talk about this because this is still related to to cavity. So what we, what we are studying is excitons. Excitons, exciton polaritons, 
in the ultra strong coupling regime in, in, an, in, in carbon nanotubes. So carbon nanotubes are one dimensional semiconductors. We, we, we're just using semiconducting carbon nanotubes here, highly purified, 6.5 uh, uh, purified. It has a huge exciton binding energy on the order of 500 milliV. And, and very anisotropic because, because the nanotubes are aligned. So the, um, yeah, so this is embedded in, inside a cavity. There are two, two angles here. So this angle is the light uh, uh, incident angle, right? So by, by changing this, uh, we can couple with finite momentum states of, of polaritons, right? As in any exciton polariton system. But what's unusual is we, we have this additional angle, phi. So, uh, so, this, so this experiment was done at a fixed phi, so the phi is fixed, and then we scan theta. So this basically, this corresponds to the in-plane momentum, and we, we have this uh, a, a polariton uh, uh, splitting. And then, we, now we fixed theta here, and then change the polarization angle. So this is interesting, right? Because so here, when, when, the, when this angle is 90 degrees perpendicular, we lose the strong coupling, zero coupling. But as we gradually rotate the polarization, uh, this splitting appears. So we have this uh, uh, single system in which the, the, the apparent G depends on, on, on the polarization of, 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 the, of the probe. Right? So if, if the polarization is perpendicular, we are weak or zero coupling regime. But then if, if the polarization is parallel to the nanotube axis, we, we have this strong coupling regime. And, this, and it, it becomes really interesting if, if, we, if we plot the dispersion relation, the entire dispersion as a function of kx and ky. So this is the traditional situation, the gallium arsenide. So energy versus kx and ky. This is isotropic in, in, in the plane. So no matter where you look, there's a gap. There's a gap between the photonic, uh, between the upper polariton and the, and the lower polariton. There's a, it, it's gapped throughout. But this is our situation. Right? So energy versus Kx and Ky, it, it's gapped only in, in a certain region of K space. Okay? So here, anti-crossing occurs. Here, crossing occurs. Okay? So um, this transition is, is, is rather uh, unusual, right? So we're changing the angle like this. So initially, no, no gap, no gap, and then it about here, so we see this. It turns out that there's an exceptional point, so here, and the, so we, between, so there are two exceptional points in, in K space, here, here, and here, here. Between these exceptional points, there's no gap, but above exceptional points, we, we, we have a gap like this. And when, when the gap is large, uh, when, when, when we are in the parallel regime, we again see huge, this is, uh, uh, so the, the splitting, the vacuum Rabi splitting is over 300 milliEV. Okay, this is, this is, this is exciton, right? The, uh, the, uh, one year excitons, by the way, these are not really Frenkel excitons. One year excitons, 300 milliEV vacuum Rabi splitting, and uh, by changing the thickness in this case, by changing the thickness, this is a highly dense densely packed nanotube films. By changing thickness, we're changing the number of nanotubes. But this, yes? Oh, well, are they aligned? It must not so be the, so easy to get them perfectly aligned. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so um, um, in this particular film, yeah. the pneumatic order parameter S is 0 0.7. So S equals 1 is perfect alignment. Yeah. In this case, it's, it's 0 0.7. So but this is. We get even bigger gaps if you were perfectly aligned. Correct, yes. So, so um, we have been making these films for, for some time, and the, when, um, this is a single chirality film. Yeah. So th that's unusual. So 0 0.7 is already impressive. Yeah, yeah. But the, when, we have, when we have a mixture of metallic and semiconducting, sometimes we get S equals nearly one. Yeah. So if I, had a, if I went to that exceptional point, uh, if I had a higher resolution, will I still see the splitting? And then would that be a single point, or would I still get these two points? To a single point, let's say. So the previous picture yes. that you had. So how does right. the resolution of your setup dictate where you're seeing these exceptional points? Spectral resolution. Let's let's see. Let me let me see if I 
understand the question. So the, I mean, there's only one exception. So, so there's yes. this point and this point are different, yes. right? So the so. so basically, you're going from something that's aligned to something that's non-aligned, right? And you're changing the depending on the orientation of your nanotubes, right? Uh, he's, he's aligning, yes, exactly. So shouldn't it be a smooth transition? So, so first of all, so uh, uh, so Motoaki developed so the calculated the, the dispersions uh, using by solving the quantum Langevin equations uh, within the input output formalism, including the, the coupling G and the dissipation through gamma and kappa. And then he derived this analytic expression for, for the omega plus and, and minus. And uh, this is a complex frequency. And uh, the, uh, you, you can see that the, under certain conditions, the, the two solutions are coalesce. And we, we used this equation to fit our, our experimental data to, to show this behavior. So, so within, within this, we have only one mode. Okay. So here it is it's like that. So, okay, so just asking sort of details of the fit there, <clears throat> because of course you, you're, you're typically measuring a projection of this under one piece of the complex plane. I mean, in principle, you would actually try and fit the imaginary frequency component separate from the real one, which involves so, looking very carefully at line shapes. So right. can you see that? Well, actually, we, we only fit the, the real part, and we calculated the imaginary right, part exactly. using the... Yeah, so, I mean, no, it, it's, it's, I mean, but, but actually, in principle, you should be able to see that, you know, from gain and loss spectrum, right? Yeah, or, or, right. Um, the lines are pretty broad. Yeah. Yes, so. Yeah, I, by the way, I'm not doubting it. I mean, I think, yeah. I don't know what else could happen, <laughs> but I mean, but it, it's, uh, yes. it, as you see, you don't see very much in the spectrum. I think that's kind of the question. Okay, so basically that, that's all I have. And uh, okay. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we had uh, some questions, and there is time for more before lunch. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you again. Uh, in your magnetic, I missed in your magnetic uh, experiment, do you see the shift? It's it, do you see that the shift of the lower coloriton is in, in the other side, as you would expect for a DK system? The other yes. side, mm -hmm. yes. I mean, if you, if you, sorry, I, because I, it's like slide 58. Slide 58. Oh, this magnetic experiment, yes. Right, you see. Do you see already the fact that you don't have an A squared term experimentally from the, from the shift? Ah, I see. Because, I mean, you show very nicely on the other system. And can you sort of see the evidence here that you actually are entitled to remove the A squared term? Let's see. Because the theory has no A squared term, so that we cannot fictitiously add A squared term. True. But you know, if you had the independent measurement, I mean, I just look by analogy, but let's say if you had the independent measurement of the uh, magnum, then you could tell whether your lower polariton or the other, uh, upper polariton is asymptotically meeting that magnum. And that would tell, I mean, in some sense, that would be close to an experimental criteria to tell you whether you have the A squared term. That's just by working with analogy, with the, do you get, are you able to I, make that statement? That's a good point. I, I, I have not looked at that issue. Experimentally. Because that would be a great way of yes, showing yes. non right. non A squared term. Uh, okay. So I was wondering if you were to do this experiment not in a quantum hole uh, state but in yes. some other gapless state uh, yes. in the finite field, would you see anything different? Why what, why is it why is why is it necessary to have it in an integer quantum hole uh, phase here? Uh, okay. So in, in the first experiment. Yeah, yeah no, not here, not this yeah, one. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. Uh, yeah. So it's so uh, so the it depends on the magnetic field and the carrier density regime. So so in in the samples we have, um, given our experimental parameters, frequency and magnetic field, we are only able to access the integer. Oh, that's the only phase you can access. The on, only that's the only. Thing. Yeah, definitely we 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 can explore the fractional regime. Okay. I for, I forgot to. Uh, yeah. Sorry, can I come back to the. 
Yes. Did your, your magnetic experiment for a second. So yes. what I didn't understand was what is the uh, what is the um, Dicky condensate phase? Is the statement just that you get a magnetic state? That this is this is an induced magnetic state of these spins? Is, so, that, is that the physics of the super radiant state? Is that it's an induced it's, magnet or is it something else? It's a ferromagnetic state. Okay. Yes. So in, in this case, super radiance means ferromagnetism. Uh, That's right. So in, in the light matter case, it's ferroelectric. In this yeah, case, yeah. ferromagnetic. Right. Okay. Good. All right. Thanks. Other questions? All right. Well, if not, let's thank them again.